Episode 58, How to Stop Sabotaging the Relationship You Have with Your Teen with Heather Frazier. Welcome to Latter-day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and certified through the Life Coach School. Together, we have one main goal, helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. Being a people pleaser is something that can get a bad rap, but in many ways, the intention of the people pleaser is very well-meaning. They want everyone to be happy, and they want to control people and situations so that the outcome is positive for everyone involved. In reality, though, it's a power struggle, and believe it or not, can be manipulative. Those being manipulated know it, and they become resentful. Having strong-willed children who make their own choices can be a challenge for any parent, but for people-pleasing parents, this can often be the worst-case scenario, because they will try to find where they went wrong, what they could have done differently, and where they need to gain back control. But children are just like anyone else. They can't be controlled. They have their own agency and want to make their own decisions. This starts to really become apparent in the teen years. As a self-declared people pleaser, coach Heather Frazier saw the damage her people pleasing tendencies had when it came to the relationship she was having with her oldest two children. Not until she let those tendencies go was she able to get the loving and open relationship she so desperately wanted with her children. They didn't magically start doing what she wanted, but she did free up a lot of space for just loving them in the choices they made. She now wants to help other parents do the same. This is a great episode if you feel you are a people pleaser when it comes to your teens, and if you want a more loving and connected relationship with them. Well, welcome everybody today. I'm glad to have all the listeners here and we are recording this. It's for my kids. It's right at the, I have kids that are in high school or yeah, high school. I keep thinking they're in elementary school. They're not, (laughs) they're in high school. We're in the middle of finals um, at the end of this first semester. And it's kind of all the moments of stress and parenting that can come up is there. They seem to be a little heightened in their emotions too. And so this for me is coming at a good time. I'm excited to talk with coach Heather Frazier today, and she is got some great tips and pointers for us. So Heather, can you, and first of all, can we just say we have the same name, which is obviously so awesome. So awesome. And I've said this before, I did not know any Heathers growing up. There wasn't like, I was the only Heather that I knew, but in this community, there seems to be quite a few of us. So it's yeah, <laughs> it's fun. Um, in high school, one of my good friends was named Heather. So oh, really? I always had friends named Heather and it's so fun. Yeah. And I didn't like, I was like, is this a weird name? Nobody has this name. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Heather, will you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and maybe yeah. even to like who you coach and how you came to this, uh, you know, to this group of people that you work with? Totally. That's awesome place to start. My name's Heather Frazier. I grew up in rural Idaho. I've been married for over 20 years to totally awesome guy. We have four biological kids and a few bonus children. And this month I'm actually going to become a grandma with one of my bonus children. So I'm super excited about that. That's so exciting. Yes. Um, Next week is the due date. But um, I've lived all over the country in the Midwest and East, and I'm settled back in Utah where we have a lot of family ties. I just live on the Orem bench and we've been here for over 10 years. My oldest bio child is at the U. She's in her early 20s. And then our son just became a legal adult. He's a senior this year. And so we're getting ready to launch him. And then I have two little princesses that are 13 and 11 and it's been way fun, (laughs) but not always, not always. How I got here was my oldest when she was about 13, she just was in this funk. I don't know if you've noticed junior high is like the worst (laughs) age for children. (laughs) 
It's the worst. So fun. So much. And fun. yeah. And she struggled and I struggled. And I had always thought of myself as a really great mom. And then I didn't because she made it very apparent that she like hated my guts. And I didn't know why, because naturally I tend towards like the people pleasing. I want everyone to like me. I don't like contention. I don't want to rock the boat. I'll be the martyr, right? If you're happy, I'm happy. Even if I am actually miserable, that's how I was raised. And that's what I took on as my kind of parenting personality. And being a martyr wasn't helping her like me anymore. And I was just sort of miserable. And on top of that, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she decided that she wanted nothing to do with the church. And that was really hard and made me feel like I had failed as a mother in my, like my one objective, right? Like teach your kids the gospel and make sure they embrace it. And then you've done a good job. That's kind of how I took on like the social norm role of an LDS mom. And so it rocked my world. I just was horrified that I had not instilled in her the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she's still 20 or she's 20 and she still is very adamantly against anything church related, but we also have an amazing relationship. And that is because of coaching. (laughs) <laughs> because I was able to stop punishing myself for her decisions and making it about me and allowing her agency because God gave all of us agency and we each have our own path to figure out. And since then, my son, our second, has also decided that he wants nothing to do with the church, but we also still have a great relationship. And he also started out adolescence not really liking me. In fact, I would go to touch him and he would just pull away and I could see how I was damaging our relationships, but I couldn't fix it. No matter how hard I tried with my people pleasing skills, it wasn't the fix. And I was scrambling for years trying to get this. I cried a lot and it was just a bad mental space for me for a couple of years until I found coaching. Darn <laughs> those people pleasing skills. That. Why don't they work? I'm, I always sit and laugh when people th- are like, I, I'm a people pleaser. And, yeah. and we think it should work because we should be everybody's why. favorite people. <laughs> yes. Seriously. But somehow- what it comes off as is manipulative though, to a lot of people. Yeah. Right. And because we are, it's people pleasing basically is just, it's lying to ourselves and to those around us. And the reason why it doesn't work is because we're giving accountability to our feelings to somebody else. An adolescent at that, like, no, do not give your emotional control over to your teenager. (laughs) They can't even do that on their own. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting thing because we do think that people pleasing is going to make everybody happy. And ultimately you're just, like you said, it's, it's control. It's like a we think it's a submissive move, but it's more of a power grab to control a situation and um, yeah. affect how somebody sees you rather than seeing the truth. Yeah. And, it, and they can feel that even if they can't articulate it, they can feel kind of the manipulation behind. And it, I say manipulation in the kindest way possible. Right. Having absolutely. been a people pleaser, like all I wanted was for my kids to be happy. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a selfish kind of manipulation, but it was a manipulation in the sense that I'm trying to adjust things so that I get what I want. Yeah. And Which- not, so I don't mean it like in a malicious way. A lot of times people take the term, manipulation in a negative light, we can mean it in the kindest of ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's truly has noble motivation behind it. Right. you like, you have the best of intentions. Yeah. Except that there's no nobility. It's no. a false nobility because <laughs> we, if, if you're familiar with like the Mormon lingo, that's Satan's plan. Yes. Let's manipulate all the people to get what we want in the end. <laughs> Yep. That that's not what we agreed on. 
Mm -hmm. We agreed to love and respect and teach and mentor and protect and provide and then also allow for agency. Which I think circles me back to one of the first things you said was that, you know, as a mom, your main objective was to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to your children and have them accept it and love it. And we think that that should be our main objective. But honestly, if we can like circle back to what you just said, like our main objective really is love because that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the first half of that, right? Like a lot of times we think if we put in X and Y into the parenting machine, then we always get Z. Mm -hmm. No, right? Like we can teach and mentor and love and they still have agency. Yeah. And it's crazy because my mind would be like, nope, you didn't have family home evening every week. You didn't always have prayers. Like you could have done this differently. Like it was grasping for control and reason as to why things had happened the way that they had, but it was all my fault. Mm -hmm. And instead there's no fault to be had. My kids just, this is their path to figuring stuff out and learning things on their own. And actually there's no fault. Nothing has gone wrong. This is just their way of figuring out what they want to believe and who they want to be. Yeah. Finding fault seems to, for some reason, if we can just figure out who to blame, whether, I mean, even if it is ourselves, it, it like gives it, it makes it easier to swallow or something like, okay, well this, yeah. then I can fix it for next time or whatever it yeah. is. We um, like the fault to be ours because yeah. then we have the control over it. Like, okay, I'll do it differently. I'll do it better. I'll do this differently so that I get what I want out of it. But all we actually want as parents for the most part is to feel love and connection with our kids, to have a good relationship with them. And we don't need to control their choices to do any of that. Which sounds like that's so so simple, right? But that's, it's hard to actually embrace that and accept that. And I think that is where so much of this work comes in is it, it really takes away the complication, the, the, the things that we put behind it that make it seem like it's an impossibility to just love them regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that we inadvertently take on the role of like wanting to save them, but they already have a savior. They don't need us. Also Christ is such a better savior than us. So our role is again, is just to love and to teach and to help and to be there for them. Like all of those Christ-like qualities and to let him do the saving. Okay. So I would imagine that when you work with your clients, so I'm assuming you work with people who, I guess we did, we, we just kind of dro- do- dove right into that. You <laughs> tell, tell everybody who you work with. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, we definitely need to circle back to that. I work with parents of teens mainly. Um, I've also coached on pretty much every other topic because they all bleed together. Right. But that's why people come to me is they're having a hard time with their teenager. I do one-on-one coaching right now. I have, because my son is a senior, I have a senior group where we meet together through the whole academic year and coach on the very specific set of issues that the senior year brings, right? Oh, cutting cool. apron strings, letting go of expectations of where they'll go to college. If they go to college, if they graduate high school, right? Like all of those kind of things. It has its own set of little issues. So I had one that graduated last year and it was like the last two, like there was always a last, like this is the last. It was like, my heart couldn't take one more last. Like they're going to die or something. (laughs) Oh, I know. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Uh, Oh, I love that so much. And what an important place to um, spend your time. I'm certain there's some common pain points that your clients come to you with. And I would love for you to share some of those with us. Yeah, there are three most common pain points that you can kind of like makes a summation of all the little nuanced stuff, but parents take things personally, right? It's really natural to be egocentric and that everything has to do with us. The irony of that is that teens actually are super egocentric and they're not thinking about us. They're thinking about them. And so nothing that they do has to do with us, but we make it mean about us. Like with my child, 
her not wanting to go to church had nothing to do with me, but I made it mean something about me that I had failed, Mm -hmm. right? That I was a crappy mom. And then black and white thinking, like now my eternal family is shot, but that's very black and white. It doesn't take into account all the rest of life that we have to live. We don't know what's on the other side of this life and what will happen next. And then knowing it all, we humans really like to know everything because it's a sense of security. We like to feel secure, but deep down, even when we think we know it all, there's discontent within us because we know we don't know. And so just to acknowledge that up front, like, I don't know what will happen in this life with me and my kids, what kind of choices they'll make, who they'll marry, if they'll marry any of that kind of stuff. And so to think that we have the answers to anything in the future or even anything that's going on right now, like making assumptions about their beliefs or what they think or the choices that they are currently making, it just causes a lot of heartache to assume that we know. To that point, we want to know things and yes. and like saying or just admitting that we don't know it feels uncertain too, right? Like we, uh, one of, they're both false, not both of them, really one of them is more of a false hope, a false belief than the other, right? One of them is just assuming or thinking like that know-it-all. We know how everything yeah. is going to go down. And our brain usually assumes the worst. Yes, yes. <laughs> worst and case it's like- scenario, 100% going to happen. <laughs> yes. So it's kind of this false reality that we create, which is uncomfortable because we're always kind of grasping on straws, grasping to straws to make that be, the reality when we have no control over that. The flip side of that is, is admitting, I have no idea what's going to happen. We don't like that certainty of that either. So that doesn't feel very uncomfortable either, except for it leaves room for you to actually live your life and the people in your life to actually live their life as well. It leaves room for there to be movement and flow. And it takes out the grasping of trying to make things be exactly how you think they should be. Yeah, for sure. And it allows for one truth that we do know that we can control, which is how we want to be and respond and show up. Yeah. So you're know it, you're like the know it all syndrome or whatever we want to call it just shifts from, you know, thinking we know how everything's going to go or should go to, I know exactly how I am going to respond in these situations. And it's always going to be with love. Right. Yeah. A lot of times we act like we know it all and it's just to mask insecurity Mm -hmm. and to mask, like to try and compensate for the fear that we have. But we, when we can embrace that, we don't know, it actually is liberating. And then we can make room to contemplate what we do actually know, because as long as we know that worst case scenario is going to happen or it's going to be fine and they're going to do what I ask them to do, there's like that tension of, I have to control this situation. And that doesn't allow for us to pay attention to what actually is controllable and is real, which is despite how this plays out, I am master of myself. I get to control myself and I'm going to love my child from that place. Because a lot of times when we're living in the fear in the worst case scenario, it's paralyzing. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you suspect your child is cutting, or maybe you know that they're cutting and it's horrifying to you and you're paralyzed because you know the path that that could lead down. You know the path that that could lead down, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that is debilitating in reaching out to them and forming real connection, getting them the help that they need. Yeah. Whereas if we're like, listen, I can't take every single knife in the house and every single razor. And they can also get in their car and go drive to the store and buy a razor. I can't stop that. But I do know that I love them, that I'm going to check on them every day, that I'm going to ask them hard questions, that I'm going to get them into counseling, that I'm going to write. And then it shifts back into what we can control and how we can love and support them. I'm curious if there are things that you see as members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that tend to sometimes make this whole parenting thing a little bit harder. I mean, there obviously are always things that are so helpful. There's so many things in, in our 
religion that make parenting, you know, we, we have the strong foundation of love and the strong foundation of um, hard work and progression. But I, I think there are some things too, that we kind of use on the flip side of that, that aren't so helpful. And I'm curious if you have found any of those things to be the case. Yes. (laughs) And I just want to say that our religion is amazing and wonderful and I love it. And also there, like everything in life, there are pros and cons there. Mm-hmm. It, we get the 50, 50 shake any way we slice life, right? No matter what kind of group or organization you affiliate yourself with, whether religious or not, there's going to be pluses and minuses. And so I say this like with utmost love and sympathy because empathy, even because I have been there, I feel like the transparency could be improved upon because so many people are hurting. So many people are like, my kid is cutting, they're struggling with gender identity. They're, you know, drinking, they're having sex, they're whatever. And I can't tell anyone. Mm. And I think that this is so tragic. Women support each other in such loving ways. And I think that if more of us were willing to show that vulnerability of like, yeah, one kid's cutting, one is failing college, one is doing this. And like, it's really hard for me. I think that we would find a lot of allies in the crowd. Ooh, I think that's a really good way to put it. Because we we think that we are just allies for each other. But in all honesty, I, I don't think we truly believe that. We're always worried about what somebody else might be for. Yeah. And I think it's a really subtle way that the adversary can get at us. He's probably not going to get us to break any major sin or, or commit any major sin or have any major crime or, but I think it's a sneaky way for pride to come in. Like that I can't show my imperfections because I'm afraid of what other people will think. Which really isn't unique to our religion, right? I mean, Absolutely that's, not. Like that's something that is like societal. And I asked that question just because I think it's good for us to be aware of the things that we, you know, traditional things that we might say because we are members of the church or things that we, you know, might question or the way that we show up in our congregations is something that I think we could all take a step back and really evaluate. Yeah. And I'm not doing. saying the other end of that spectrum is post post on Facebook every single issue your family's having. Don't do that either. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Like your status doesn't need to change on the hour depending on what your right. kids are deciding to do. Right. But there's a happy medium of finding a support system that you know has your back. And then also reaching out and supporting other people. I have some friends going through some challenges right now, and they've been surprised at how members in our neighborhood just have kind of fallen silent. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I thought that we were friends. I thought that they had my back, but like, they haven't talked to me in a month. And this goes into also making everything mean something about us, because I think that for them, it's easy to say they must not like me. They must not have my back. But another higher likely thing is that they're making it about them, right? Because we make everything mean something about us. And it actually means they're really uncomfortable and they don't know what to say. They're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. They're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. They don't know how to comfort because they can't relate to the situation. And it just, it's hard for them to reach out and do something. And so for anybody in that situation, I would just say, it's okay to say, I have no idea what to say. This is new territory for me and I love you and I'm here for you. I want to help you. I don't know how. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, because compassion isn't necessarily doing something. It's being willing. And this is the part that's really hard for people is being willing to just sit with somebody and saying words like that. Like I have no idea feels uncomfortable. And we think we should just kind of that know it all thing, right? We think we should know how to handle all the situations. So saying that we don't can feel really uncomfortable, but 
in doing so, you are telling somebody you're willing to mourn with them when they're mourning, right? Without totally. having to know the perfect thing to say. Yeah. And even saying, listen, I can see you're going through something. I have no idea. You don't even need to tell me, but I'm here. Yeah. Right. Sometimes we can see that somebody is suffering. It's easy for just look around other parents in the neighborhood. They're having a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all are. It's just, yeah. It's easy and, to think we're the only ones. And it's okay. Yeah. All those things said, you know, like struggling in our lives and having situations that are, are circumstances in our kids' lives or circumstances in our lives. We do talk a lot in coaching about circumstances, but we don't spend a lot of time there. Like we, we, you'll often hear people say, you know, we, we can't choose our circumstances, but we can choose how we react to them. And we don't talk about the circumstances a lot, but there are circumstances. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> and honestly, the better we understand them, the easier it is to reframe them. That's super coachy. By that, I mean, come up with thoughts about them that are more helpful. Some interesting facts about teens. So these would fall under the circumstance line and it ties into taking it personally, the black and white thinking and the knowing it all. We don't understand what's going on inside their brains. So I have clients come to me and they're like, it's like my kid doesn't get it. They don't care. They can't see the long game. I hear this all the time and they're right. They <laughs> <You're> can't. Right. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. So just like when they're babies and even as adolescents, they're growing so fast. I remember my son, like I would have to buy him new shoes every other month and pants because he just got six feet tall, like overnight and they're growing. And we think that because they're as tall as us and their voice is dropped that they think like us, they do not. And so the circumstance of the adolescent brain is that for me, I've noticed it around the age of eight or nine, like when they get baptized, that's actually psychologically when they can tell right from wrong, it's actually a thing. And they start to go down this slippery downhill slope and emotionally on average, they are most likely to hate themselves the most at about age 13, junior high. <laughs> and then they slowly stage. come back out of it. And by like the age of 16, I'm like, oh, it's my kid. They're back. <laughs> what happens is their amygdala, their emotional response starts to grow first. The emotional response that they have is greater than an adult's. They have so much more feeling. And if you pay attention to your kid, you can see it. They'll come home and they'll flop on the couch and be like, this was the worst day ever, you know? And it's because of something that we would think is totally stupid or like, really, that's a big deal to you. <laughs> but A, we they don't have anything else to stress about. And B, it's because their emotions are on hyperdrive. Everything is a huge deal and catastrophic to them. This is why teenagers get in fights all the time. Because their amygdala is on hyperdrive. Their emotions are through the roof. And that's the fight, flight, or freeze response area as well. And so the boys fight. The girls get catty behind each other's backs. It's normal. It's actually totally normal. And that's like the gas pedal. And then the brakes, which is the adult thinking, it starts to come around at around the age of 15 or 16. And this is the part that can plan for the future, but it's only starting to grow when they're making a lot of really important choices. It's not fully developed in most adults until around the age of 25. And by then a lot of choices have been made in life where we're going to go to college. If we're going to get married, all those kinds of things are up for grabs while their brain is still under major development. And so when clients are like, I can't believe that they don't even consider the future. And I tell them and they don't, it's like, they don't get it. They don't, they don't get it. And that's okay. They don't have to get it. We all survive it. It's how God intended it to be for whatever reason is his own, but 
when I explain this to my clients, it can bring a lot of relief because then they're like, okay, it's hard for them to think about their actions. What we do as coaches, how we reframe things and kind of look like a third party at what we're thinking and doing, that's called meta thinking. And they are not neurologically capable of doing that until later adolescence. Mm -hmm. So meta thinking is in essence, thinking about our thinking. Yes. And it's watching yourself as a third party. Yeah. And we think they should be able to do that, but in actuality, nothing's gone wrong. We're asking them to fly. They don't have wings. Yeah. So it really does take almost like trust in our heavenly father. Like you said, to know that there's a reason why there's a perfect plan. Our bodies are functioning exactly how they're supposed to be. Because I remember thinking as a 21 year old, and I was making decisions about, you know, getting married or going on a mission. I remember thinking it seems so unfair that I'm having to make the biggest decisions of my life when I have the least life experience. (laughs) Yeah. But there has to be a reason why this is the time frame that it happens in. So it, I think it really is true. I do yeah. have a question. Is there any difference between the female and the male brain in the development of the, of the amygdala or any of those things? Or are they, is it the same? I'm sure there is. I can't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> I have taken psychology courses and adolescent psychology. They were more surface. I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. I just was a thought, but, but I'm sure that there are, I mean, if you look around, like the response that most boys had, like I had, like I said, is to fight. Mm -hmm. And whereas girls, we retreat and cry. And then we might be catty behind their back or something, but yeah, it's all totally normal. And it actually serves a purpose because when we can allow our children to take risk because they will. And it depends on the child, right? Like I just within my own family, I have some very strict rule followers that don't like taking risks and some crazy risk takers. It's actually serves them that they don't have that prefrontal totally developed saying, this is a dumb idea because we learn best through experience. And this is true for our children as well. And for them to learn how far they can push the envelope is actually really great to learn the risks. I can take these financial risks, these educational risks, these personal risks, and this is the point at which I get burned. So then as adults, when the stakes are much higher, when they have a family and a mortgage, then they can take those calculated risks with experience under their belt. Yeah. And so when they are younger and making, you know, pushing the envelope, it's kind of hard for us to watch as parents, but when we can do the work around this and get really clear on who we want to be and how we want to show up, then we're able to show up as that soft landing spot when they do have hardships from the yeah. and consequences from the choices that, that we allow yeah. them to make. It's, it's like a circus performer. We are their safety net underneath them to catch them because they won't always have that. And so they need to learn how to walk the tight ropes. And we can be that net underneath them for as long as possible. But ultimately, they have to walk the tight rope. And if we're right up on the rope, holding their hands and micromanaging and telling them how to do it, like not actually good for their long game. Yeah, no, it's not. Okay, Heather. So before we go, I, you know, one thing does come to my mind and and I do want you to share with everybody where they can find more of you, but can you maybe share a little bit about, you mentioned you have two older children and then two, two younger children. I think you called them princesses. What did you, I think you oh, <laughs> they're my two little princess. Oh yes. Yeah. I love, them. I love all my kids, but it's fun when they still like you. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is fun. And I am noticing too, that I have, you know, I have two at home. I have four children as well and two still at home. And, and it's a different experience with, with, with them because I'm different and yes. because I'm different. They actually, I think are showing up different too. Um, so I, I am just curious if you could share with us what is different, what you're finding to be different between the older, yeah, the older children. Yeah. And the older children. Well, like you said, I'm a totally different parent because With my oldest two, I experimented with all the coaching tools to remedy 
our relationship. And with these younger two coming up, those tools are in place. And so hopefully there won't be as much remedying. Hmm. And they're completely different personalities. My oldest two are very like fiercely independent, can't be told what to do, extraordinarily strong-headed, which I think will serve them so well. But it was me trying to figure out how to deal with them because that's completely different than me. My younger two, my youngest, I'm not so sure yet. She's kind of a fireball, but I have one that's extraordinarily anxious and wants to do everything right and tends to be more like perfectionistic. And so for her, I have to push her to like break rules and be outside of her comfort zone on the total opposite end of the spectrum. Isn't that Um, funny? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But the beauty of it is, is that it's all right. Everything played out exactly how it should for my family, just like it is for all of my clients. And when we can master these tools, it benefits all the relationships in every direction. And so I wouldn't have done it any different. I think that it was really important for me to experience the heartache that I have and also the joy that I have. And same with my clients. I don't believe anybody's story is wrong or that any of us have messed up beyond hope. The, one of the things that really stood out to me is you had, you said the statement, it's all right. Meaning, you know, everything is a right choice, right? For everybody yeah. or whatever, how, whatever choices they make, it's the right choice for them. But I also heard it as being, it's all right. You know, like there's not a space in between those words. Like it, it is, it's all right. Like everything's going to be all right because every choice that's going to be made and the way people do things is going to be right as long as we can, it's up to us to like have that perspective. And when we can have that perspective and, and be open-minded and be that safe place for our children to land, then everything is all right for us and for them. And yeah. And I think that that's the most Christ-like perspective too. Not saying that if your kids are doing things that, oh, how do I say this? (laughs) That you'd prefer them not to. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're drinking or being more permissive than you would like. I'm not saying that those choices are right and there's nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But in the sense that through Christ, everything can be right. Yeah. And that it's our job to behave most like him, which is does not include condoning, but it always includes unconditional love. Yeah, so good and such a good distinction. I think it's yeah. really it is really hard to find to find that line, that balance between behaviors that we do and don't like or we know what really don't lead to a great place, but yeah. And I have conversations with my kids and they tell me the things that are going on in their lives. I don't condone some of them, but I am there to love and support. And it's actually a beautiful thing that they can come to me with all aspects of their life. They don't hide stuff from me. Yeah. I was just going to say that. That's amazing. It's amazing that you created a space where they feel safe to share with you the things that, because you know that they have to know that that's oh, not they know. your favorite. Right. But, but you have made it a place where they still feel like they can share with you. And wouldn't you much rather know than have it be. Yeah. I mean, so that I can be there to support and love and mentor and, and just be connected. I love that we can be connected on all the levels. Oh, Heather, thank you so much. Okay. Before we go, tell everybody where they can find more of you. <laughs> Super easy. HeatherFraser.com is my website. Fraser is spelt F-R-A-Z-I-E-R. There's a Z-I in the middle. Um, that's my website and it's got my podcast. It hosts all kinds of good things there. And then you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at Heather Fraser Coaching. I love to interact with everyone. So DMs, all the good things. You can, If you're not into social media, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website And that's just at the bottom of the homepage, super easy to find. And you can be my pen pal and respond to any of my emails. I send out emails once or twice a week with pertinent, helpful information. 
super easy. It's awesome. All these things will be linked in the show notes and you can find all the links actually on ldslifecoaches.com. If you yes. were to search for Heather's name, you'd find her there too. So thank yes. you so Such much. A great resource. Fantastic. We'll see you later. Thanks for having me. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.